Good. Yeah, well, I, this is we, we decided to do this event um, a little bit differently tonight than our normal event. And I know we have some people from all around. My friend Eric, who is in Virginia. Welcome, Eric. Um, and uh, we figured generally our experience is that when we focus on um, African cinema or cinema of the third world, we have pretty small audiences. So we figured we would have a, a more in-depth conversation than the normal lecture that we have. Yeah. Uh, so we're gonna, we're gonna, Stom and I are gonna jump in and we're gonna do some talking and show some clips. Um, and during that period, we would love if you would mute yourself um, and um, you can leave your cameras on or not. We'll be spotlighting Samba and I, and um, and you know you'll be seeing the clips. Um, and after we talk for a little bit, we're going to welcome your questions. You're free to uh, type them into the chat, um, and you can chat with each other, and you can say hello to each other, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but after a point in time, we'll also just take live questions from you guys because we want to hear your thoughts on the film. It's a really provocative film. Did Hopefully you guys got a chance to watch the film um, prior. If not, it's um, still live. You can watch it afterwards. You'll get a sense of everything that we're talking about. Um, so to start us off officially, uh, I'm Jason Silverman. I'm the director of the CCA Cinematheque. Um, thanks to Amra Nash, who's here with us. Um, uh, she is the director, uh, associate director of operations at CCA and has made uh, these virtual events run as smoothly as is humanly possible. <laughs> we're all in the steep learning curve. And, um, and we're really grateful. That we've done something north of 50 um, virtual cinema or virtual uh, film programs, film and arts programs since we started the living room program 10 days after lockdown in Santa Fe. So uh, we've been hard at it. We just think it's really important that everyone has a chance to connect during this time of isolation. And um, tonight's a really special night because I am introducing um, a person who's been really influential in my own understanding of the world. Um, and uh, Dr. Samba Gajigo is joining us from um, Mount Holyoke. I'm sorry, oh, yes, South Hadley, nope. Massachusetts is the name of this town. He's been a professor at uh, Mount Holyoke College for um, 170 years. <laughs> he is uh, the world's great authority on Usman Semben, known as the father of African cinema. He's written biographies on Semben. He teaches French and African studies at Mount Holyoke. He's been um, chair of the French department numerous times, has won faculty awards. Um, and he's also my partner in crime, my creative partner for the last 13 years, we've been working on projects together. Um, we just finished um, producing DVD extras for the Criterion Collection. Uh, they're gonna be releasing Semban's films and a project that provides African cinema to African communities in Africa. So I am not an expert in African cinema. Samba is, but I have a lot of thoughts on it. We're gonna have a good conversation about, about it all. So hold your questions or type your questions into stat, uh, into chat and uh and um we're just going to do a brief introduction i just want to tell you why i chose this film i think this film uh it's just been restored it's 16 years old or 14 years old it was nominated for an oscar for best foreign language film um and it the issues that it explores I, this film could have been made yesterday it hasn't aged one minute in the time that it was made and um, each time I see it, I learn something new, and it's filled with provocations. Um, and I think it's filled with provocations for African audiences, particularly. Um, but for audience in the West, I think it also um, really, it, it pokes at some wounds. So um, I want to, I'm really eager to hear Samba's thoughts on it. And um, so Maybe we could just get started, Simon. You can tell us maybe a little bit about the context. Maybe give us a little context on how we can best understand this film. Okay, well, thank you, Jason. And uh, it's always a pleasure to be at the CCA, even virtually. Uh, the adventure started there a few years ago, and I think it has been arguably one of my most productive encounters 
to be working with CCA, to be working with Jason. Basically, we have been working on a big project we call the Semben project, which is in a nutshell about storytelling. And uh, when you are talking about storytelling today, I think more than literature, more than the traditional storyteller who is a griot, it is the cinema that is really taking that torch and playing that, that role. Uh, and um, uh, Abdurrahman Sisoko actually is of the third or fourth generation of filmmakers. I mean, for some of you, of course, here in the West, you know that cinematography as a means of expression was invented in 1895. And already starting in 1900, Africa had been the setting of films made by explorers, by colonizers. But then what is interesting in this vast continent that served as a setting for cinema, Africans were not accorded the humanity that they deserved. Most of the time they were part of the, the setting. And then of course, the Western filmmaker, the British and the French, understanding the very importance in, of cinema, of storytelling in setting the agenda of the relationship between Africa and the West, of course, tried also to mute Africans. The first film arrived in 1900 and the Africans did not pick up the camera until after independence in 1960. So African cinema is of course meant to break the emptiness of that silence. It is meant to show Africa in a different light, Africa from an African perspective. And I think it's very, very interesting. The first pioneer, of course, uh, Jason just mentioned is Usman Samben who started making films in the sixties. Well, it just happened that there has been an uninterrupted chain of storytellers who have been carrying that, story, that uh, griot tradition, starting with Semben, second generation, Suleiman Sise of Mali, and then Sheikh Omar Sissoko of Mali, and then uh, uh, Abdurrahman Sissoko, who was born in 1961. Very interesting, born right only when African independence was one year old. Sheikh Omar Sissoko is very, very interesting. Well, some people call him Mauritanian, others call him Malian, I call him a Sahelian, meaning his cinema is a mirror that reflects the reality of all that region of sub-Saharan Africa, Mali, Senegal, Cote d'Ivoire, Guinea, and so on. And it's very, very, I met him many times. He speaks the languages of all those, of all those countries. So he started, he attended film school, of course, in Moscow. In 19, from 1983 to 1989, which is very, very significant, which of course oriented his understanding of the role of the cinema and what kind of cinema he should make for the African people. Not solely entertainment cinema a la Hollywood or commercial cinema like the Western cinema, but a cinema that would give voice to the voiceless. A cinema that would play a very interesting role in mirroring the African reality, what Semben has called the cinema as an evening school, meaning you pick up your camera as a device to dialogue with your people. And you notice this film here is in, is in Bambara. And all of the Sissoko films are in Bambara, which is the first political act. Because the most important is not really to make a political cinema, but to make a cinema politically, meaning then, you use your own language to communicate with your own people, to create your own aesthetic. Now, uh, his first feature film goes back to 1998. It's called La Vie sur Terre, uh, Life on Earth, which is a cele He took the opportunity of the celebra celebration of the new millennium to reflect on the place of Africa in this new world order in terms of technology. And he takes that back to his village. It's full of humor, it's full of uh, anger, it's full of verite. It's also full, I think, with a good heartedness, like over and above the different cultural differences, economic differences. I think Suleim, uh, Sheikh uh, Abdraman Sisoko is a, is a poet whose main vision 
is to use art to create a dialogue among, among the people. And then the film we are about to see tonight, uh, I mean, which you have already seen, was made in 2006. 2006. And it is a reflection, stark reflection, of many issues, but mainly the situation of Africa 20 years after the era of independence. Most countries of that region gained independence in 1960. I went to school in 1960. I the son of a person from the village who never had a wage, I would never have gone to school without public support. I would never have been where I am without public support. So the film is about after 20 years of African independence, a continent in search of its economic, political, and the cultural, uh, uh, his country liberation and integration. The film starkly puts a finger on the introduction of Africa in the neoliberal economy, how privatization have killed all our dreams of independence and emancipation. So I think that's in a nutshell, uh, the, the context of the film, how the World Bank, the uh, International Monetary Fund and all those Western international institutions have, uh, have conspired, so to speak, to continue the colonization of Africa. Now, the colonization is not with the, the, the Bible and the sword. It is with the briefcase and the internet under the banking institutions. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it would be that, what a great introduction. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, <laughs> um, that was brilliant. Um, let's, let's set the scene of the, the, it's such an interesting film and it's, I think a lot of us, me included, haven't seen any, anything quite like it before. So maybe we can just talk about the, briefly about the big themes of the film through telling the story a little bit. It's a story of a tribunal. Yes. But it's a tribunal that's being held in the courtyard of, uh, you know, in a, you know, working class neighborhood. Yes. Is that right? Yes, it is. It is in Bamako in an ordinary house and we see them as the trial is, I mean, it is a trial, which is of course a reflection of, again, a Western institution. In quote unquote traditional Africa, public affairs are not solved with this decor, with this setting, with these lawyers and so on. So it is, again, if you want, it is a way that the West has appropriated even our institutions, even our social, regulations, even our social discourse. And there's an attempt to parrot those institutions as happens here. And instead of it being in an official courtroom, um, you know, the the attorneys have to hold this podium that's just a piece of wood that shakes back and forth. And yes, there's yes. not there's no officialness to it. This is it's largely rep it's largely just a metaphoric process. I mean, in the context of the film. Yeah, in the context of the film, but I think it's also a kind of a, how do you call it again? Uh, Sisoko, his way to show that how Africans have adopted wholesale this, uh, uh, this European court system. You see the costumes. I mean, you have 95 degree heat. You have these people wearing these wigs, having these attires and so on and so forth. But what is interesting here, it is a kind of, reverse gazed. Usually it is the West that puts Africa on the stand, right, to judge Africa. This time, it is Africans who give themselves the opportunity to judge the international institutions, meaning the World Bank. So this time, it is not the Africans at the receiving end, but it is, uh, it is the European. But there is a very powerful image at the beginning when the film opens, who are in the courtyard, all the lawyers are sitting. And this old man, the griot, who is a traditional storyteller, who is the guardian of the past of African collective memory, who is also the guardian of speech, of word. Uh, there is this uh, very uh, common say in, in most of our Africans. Actually, it is a writer from Mali, uh, Amadou Ampateba, who says that in Africa, an elderly who dies 
is a library of flame, meaning that knowledge, wisdom is embodied into age. So the elderly, uh, you would say in that gerontocratic system, elder people are revered, they're sacred. Well, how does the trial open? He comes forward, wants to speak. First thing he's told is old man, Chekoroba, if you go fugulangfo, old man, you have to take off your hat. Do you want me to try to play that scene and we can look at that? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, let's, let's take a look at that. I think I have that queued up. So let's give yeah. it let's let's give that a shot here. Right. Monsieur Lucie Oviancé, euh, demandez à monsieur de se décoiffer. Dites-lui que ce n'est pas encore son tour. Il aura l'occasion de parler. Pour le moment, qu'il se retire dans la salle. Torba, ikmakma Macedonia, makma dima koro, yanikma kasima, ikati siri siri ora. Aiwa, kuma le feya shodo. Na bi du sukula, bi du sukul meno. Ni ma so kafo kafo ati. Omi bi du sukuna, ni ba fe kafo. Afo kuma besi. Gasiza no, kuma le makma dima. Ikato koro, ikati siri siri ora. Aïwa, <coughs> So yeah, you can stop it there. I think there are two significant issues here. As I mentioned, he seems to be the oldest person in this court, but they reverse the hierarchy. Instead of allowing him to talk, they told him he has to be silent. But then what more interesting, the court does not address him in Bambara. They are using an interpreter in a foreign language, which shows already really the, the how do you call it, the break of the disconnect between Africa and the, the rest of the world. Africans are the only people who are not allowed to talk to international institutions using their own languages. It's always mediated through a European language. That's what. Can we talk a little bit about what that, what that means? I mean, there is, we're going to watch a scene that yeah. talked about language that suggests language and identity can you what is it what does it mean that a proceeding would be held in french um for an elder for you know I, what's lost in translation what's what's lost in general when we when we obliterate a language well uh, all everything is lost in that process here i mean i i told you i went to school in 1960 until 1960, the only language I spoke was Fulani, was Bambara, was Mandinka. Uh, even Wolof, I did not speak until, until later. But as the saying goes, you may speak 1,000 languages, but only one language speaks to you, which is your native language. But it has happened that as soon as you enter school, even a couple of years after independence, all African languages are prohibited. Just imagine the psychological trauma of being unable to express yourself, your inner feelings into your native language. You have to try to express them in a borrowed language. But that was intentionally made by the, by, by the French because they realized the best way to colonize. Of course, it was the taking of our raw materials. It was the process of taking our, our natural resources, but also colonizing the mind was the best way to perpetuate that reality and how to achieve it through schools, through education in Western languages, whether in English, in Portuguese or in French. Now it also has in imposing that foreign language, which is still the official language of the majority of African countries, right? French is, uh, let's say when the French, the French first school was open in 18, 
17. The colonizer did not leave until, but did not leave symbolic until 1960. In almost 300 years, only less than 35% of Africans could express themselves in the native language. What did it mean? Meaning then the language of the minority elite was used to marginalize the languages of the majority Africans. If you want to do international trade, it has to be through French or English. If you want to do international relations, it has to be inter uh, European language. If you want to have a social mobility, it has to be uh, in European language. Instead, our languages were kind of relegated to the realm of folklore because they did not intervene in shaping our institution. And that wound is still going on, Jason. It's very common to go to Mali or to go to Senegal to have a judge who, who is Wolof, the accused who is Wolof, the defendant who is Wolof, but they speak to each other through a Western language. Amazing. So I'm gonna this this seg this takes us into the, the role of storytelling too. And and you know, I think we're gonna be able to talk more deeply about it after we watch this clip. Let me know when you want to cut this clip off or we can turn the sound down and um, talk over the clip. This is the this is the clip that I I I called evening school sarcastically. It's right. going to start with with um, a family gathering in a courtyard to um, watch a movie. Yes. This this thing is very very interesting. Usually the courtyard in the evening is a place a, a gathering place where the old family gets together and the elders tell the youngers, the youngsters stories, like storytelling, like bedtime stories, which are not just fairy tales, but it is also a way to educate the youth. Now what has replaced that? It is the TV, which is a medium that's placed in the middle of the, ho of the house to mimic that evening school. But what is a program we see into that TV we see a Western movie. Yeah, and 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 before we get there, yeah. you know what another man is doing during this evening. The husband yes. is um, he's learning foreign languages two at once, including Hebrew. And he's learning uh, Hebrew because it's planned that Israel is going to have an embassy in Bamako, and he's already positioning himself for a security guard. And the the and of course you know uh, this is not a comedy this movie although the, as a satire it has some pretty yeah uh, you know, some occasionally amusing things and the 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 actual phrases that he's learning like I've lost my wallet are yeah. are, are, are very telling so I'll continue with the, sorry I'll, I'll continue with the clip yes continue right. And you see how mesmerized all the youth is sitting there waiting. And this is Radio Television Mali. What is shown that really people do not think, first of course, the technology is completely crappy <laughs> because we don't get the, the, the most updated technology from the West. But then our program, our head of state, our government do not have any project, any vision of a society. So what happened is that the vacuum left by traditional storytelling, that space has been taken over by stories that are manufactured from somewhere else. So what does it cause? And it is not just in Mali. You go now to the most remote villages in Africa, including mine, which is actually in Western Senegal, in the evening, people don't get together anymore to tell stories. Uh, you have every compound, you have a big TV screen where people gather to watch Brazilian telenovela, to watch Hollywood film, which are dubbed in, uh, which are dubbed in French. So the result of that is that we no longer have our local heroes. Our heroes are superheroes in the, in the Western cinema. It was very, I know when I was growing up, <laughs> when I was in high school, my nickname was James Brown. James Brown, who is an African-American singer. Uh, many people in Semben's generation, for example, you call, see them call each other Django. Django, who is a main character of a movies, yeah, spaghetti uh, <laughs> movies here in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the United States. So but, the danger 
is not just the taking of our material wealth, it is the occupation of our own imagination. But uh, the, the last character was introduced is, is Palestine's most famous filmmaker. So you, yeah, have, yeah. you have a group of African and North African yes. um, uh, celebrities who are playing these roles here, which is, which is interesting in its own right. What's interesting to me about this, what we see on screen, this film within a film samba, mm -hmm. is um, the violence and the plot is so convoluted. The violence is so unnecessary and random and chaotic it's it's posited as a western on the one hand yeah on the other hand it's just random um random violence with with um unnecessary suffering with no end game no plot no winners no i mean losers but no winners um it's pretty it's remarkable in that way to me yes remarkable because the problem really at least for me uh, having grown up in Senegal and straddling the two cultures, meaning the Western culture and the African culture, the problem is not actually the importation of European stories, but it is the quality, what is embedded in those stories. It is not the best of the stories. It is not the uplifting stories, but it is Africa has become the dumping ground of all films that have already recouped their investment here in the, in the West. So there is no discrimination. And the movie theaters don't have local programs. So any program, and actually many Western ambassadors in Africa, use cinema to control the youth, meaning they give free programming to African TV, TV stations. And the result of it is not only we live on foreign aid, which Semben has chastised in his filmography, but also we live on imported cultural values, which serve to brainwash. So the film is packed with a lot of elements. I mean, this scene here with the TV in the middle of the house, meaning the traditional storyteller has been completely supplanted. But I mean, the, yes. Yeah, we, I mean, and we cut away and, you know, this, this, this random act of violence is celebrated. And these kids, these kids right here are laughing. Yes. <laughs> Yes, but listen, Jason. When I when I when I when I was young and we went to see the Tarzan movies, we always applauded when the white person won, and we always chastised the black people. That was the goal. That was the objective to glorify the heroes of colonization and to show the black people as just a bunch of followers of losers so to so to so to speak so it cinema played a very very important role in the colonization of africa and now it is becoming a decisive instrument of mantle decolonization so back to back to sisako for a second um yes. can we talk about um i i, I guess we're going to shift into the politics of this now yes. um what the what the film makes clear is that this suffering, this um, obliteration of culture mm -hmm. um, is programmatic. It's not, it's not a byproduct no. of bad policy, but it's actually part of the plan. That's what the film suggests. What Sisoko is saying in my view is that Africa is victim of its riches. And it goes to show through international institutions, the, well, through, of course, slavery first, then through colonization, now through these international institutions, how Africa has been, quote unquote, underdeveloped. It is not, Africa is the richest continent in the world, but Africans are the poorest. So meaning that it is not a nature made poverty, but it is a systemic induced poverty. So it is as if there is a correlation between the wealth of the North and the poverty of, 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 the, of the South, because our, our raw materials are taken, sent to the West and then processed and sent back to us with doubles of the normal price. It's, it's three times more expensive 
to buy a car in Dakar than to buy a car in the United States. So we, we it, it is a systemic programmed, uh, well thought of system, not only Africa, but also Latin America. I mean, what is called the third world, which uh, came into being, as you may know, since 1955, when the newly independent countries and the still the colonized country met in 1955 in Indonesia to create what they call um, the third world, basically. And the relationship between the third world and the first world of the United States and the second world, which is, of course, their economic relationship, their political relationship, but also their cultural relationship. And they are all intertwined. So, um... In the film, the film, the film has a, um, in, in addition to the film inside the film we just saw, it has some in interesting reflections on storytelling. For example, mm -hmm. there is a cameraman who bribes the guard to gain entrance into mm -hmm. the courtyard to film the proceedings. Yes. He's told to not film the proceedings. Yes. And then it's revealed that he is actually, um, he films crime scenes for the police. Yes, and also, I mean, he says something that is very interesting. I mean, he's so devoid of interesting topic. He's so censored from filming what is essential. He said now the only money making business for him is to film funerals and weddings. So basically his camera that could have been used for political purposes is also silenced the same way that the griot is silent, the same way the elders are silent, the same way the African societies are, are silent. What is called, what Sisoko is showing is really what is called globalization. It is not globalization because it is a one-way flux of goods and the stories. They go from the north to the south. The stories go from the north to the south. The only thing I got from the south to the north is our raw materials, basically. And all that shows how, actually, there is a very powerful image. The only happy image you see in the film is a photograph of the couple when they were young. That's the only place they show them smiling. Which is, which is, in both times you see it, it's, it's quickly covered by a shadow. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So it is a, a under the guise of helping develop Africa, the West is underdeveloping, is underdeveloping Africa. And it, according to Sisoko, it's a well concerted scenario. And it is not just in this film, but since we are talking about this film, he also made another, another film in 2002, which is called Heramakono, meaning waiting for happiness, which is also about desolation, migration. And then you have all seen the film Tombuktu, which is about religious fundamentalism. So right. some, some, uh, Sisoko's camera really hijacks the major narrative of the day, the major political, cultural, social issues, and transform his camera into an instrument of denunciation. And of, and of course, it's the, it's the issues of the day, but it's 14 years later. We're gonna watch a scene now that yeah. explores migration and yeah. of course, migration was an issue that we were struggling to contend with in 2006, 2020, almost 2021. It's worse, more problematic, more troubling um, than ever. So yeah. we're going to watch a scene about that right now. Okay. If we knew. Oops. Yeah, this is heart wrenching. It shows all the hypocrisy in the relationship between Africa and the rest of the world. They talk about globalization, but any European, any American only need an ID card to jump on a plane and go to Africa. And Africans are so blocked that look at 200 years ago, we woke up 
And we saw people coming from Europe on our shores armed with weapons without any invitations and today it has not changed any french you only need a national id to jump on a plane from to senegal now our children have to go through the desert of sahara to go to algeria to go to libya to cross the mediterranean Risk, risking death every moment just last week 220 young senegalese drowned in the mediterranean because the COVID-19 has so much exacerbated the economic situation because our leaders have lent, have uh, signed so many fishing agreements that people can Mamour, even fish and Mamour, cannot Mamour, find fish anymore. Mamour, so Mamour, what is the only recourse? It is to migrate, meaning uh, people are sacrificing their lives, like confronting the ocean, confronting the desert, to go to what they construe as being the El Dorado meaning the safe heaven of Europe. But then, of course, they don't know. Uh, Europe is just a mirage. That Not that everything that glows is gold. So I think this scene is very, very symptomatic okay. of his denunciation. Of the good, good here. We are okay, being bled go. of our youth, of our okay. life. Okay. The same way that slavery had bled us of this we have been denied any education. Est-ce que Faso ye fura do ila ki fura kewa? The state has never given you healthcare. Faso ye barada ye lawa. Have they given you job? No. Have they given you money? No. Nothing. You have not received anything. Fou idea. Est-ce que mo fou idea? So our state has failed. We need to have completely abandon the mission they have been elected for. And this situation is very, very dangerous because it is the most able-bodied, the most educated Africans who are braving now the elements to go up north. And what they are carrying is not just their own individual dream, it is the dream. Every one of us who comes to the West carries the dream of a whole family, of a whole compound. Going back, go, going back without success is the biggest shame that reflects on, on the on the on, on, on the on the family. So let me. There's a question. There's a there's a question from um, Vicky um, in our audience, and we're going to open it up soon to questions, um, and we can have a conversation. Um, she asks about the trial, where it the references to Africa in general, as opposed to West Africa or to Mali, they, there is conversation about Mali, there is conversation about Senegal. I mean, it's localized. Can you talk about why Sisiko may have chosen to talk about Africa in general rather than about um, the specific region? Well, because Mali is, just, Bamako actually is every African country. Mali is every African state. All those newly founded states in the 60s are an outgrowth or result of the colonial enterprise. So we are all in the same boat. Whether you go to Mali, you go to Guinea, you go to Senegal, you go to Gabon, you go to Niger, the same colonial language, which is French. Whether you in any country where you go, we are entangled with those institutional financial institutions like the World Bank, and the International Monetary Fund. So that, I think Bamako is just a, an allegory, or it is just a symbol to represent the entire, the entire continent. And of course, yes, he talks about Mali, but his pan-Africanist view is very, very visible in the, in the, in, in, in the, in the film. Bamako you, again. Hmm? You use the phrase pan-Africanism. Can you tell us what that means? What the, because it's a movement and where it stands today and where Sisiko might fit into that? Yes, uh, but if you want, the pan africanist movement is a very, very long dream that comes from the division of Africa at the Berlin Conference in 1985. 1885. 1885, sorry. 1885, all Western countries were already in competition for occupying land in Africa. So to avoid that kind of competition and conflict, the Western powers, France, Germany, 
uh, England with United States as observers and Germany, of course, got together in Berlin under Bismarck. And they took what they call a blank map of Africa because for them, any land that has not been discovered by white people is not, does not exist. So it is a white gaze, the white footprint that gives existence. So they carved out what critics have called the African cake, one section for the French, not taking into account the historical realities or the cultural realities. So they divided the continent. If you take, for instance, the case of Senegal, right? Within Senegal, you have a strip which is only 30 miles, which is called the Gambia. Same people, same indigenous languages, same stuff, but different official languages and a different government system. So the tearing apart of a continent is what people are trying to, to, to mend. Of course, the idea of Pan-Africanism predates our independence in the 60s. Actually, it said that the idea started with W.E.B. Du Bois, who talked about the reunification of the, of the African continent. Because Du Bois, among other intellectuals, knew that Africa was a cradle of humanity. That today, wherever you go in the world, you have black people, you have a black diaspora. So the idea is to bring back that organic unity of Africa. Actually, in 1963, after our independence, the independent African nations met in Addis Abeba to create what they call Organization of African Unity, which today has become the African Union. So if you want to pan-Africanism, is an ideology, it is a movement, it is a political will to end the political, economic, and social divide of Africa and to come up in a unified front for the economic, social, and the political development of the continent. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. That's a good description. We have a question about the Grio yes. scene. Um, which why don't we look at? It's such a powerful scene. Do you do you want to say anything before we, before we? What you know? We we've been we've actually both used the word griot. Yeah. I'm not sure that everybody knows what a griot is, so maybe you could give us a brief introduction. Yeah, griot is mostly. It's not just Senegal. It's not just Mali. It's all the Sahel region, or if you want, it's all the oral countries where we had our oral cultures. Because as you may know. To the few exception maybe of East Africa, many of African countries did not get in contact with writing until Islamization with the Arabs and then colonization with the Europeans. But there is no, there is no country without culture. There is no country without literature. There is no, uh, uh, there is no country without memory. So the griot are these institutions, these specific families that are part of the people, but whose specialty is the control of the word. The word is not, is really a misnomer. It's a, it's lost in trans transition. That as the old man said that when they told him, oh, you cannot speak, you have to wait for, he said, I have something to say and I carry it in me. So these are the guardians of African memory. There are historians because it's not written, right? There are genealogists. The entertainers, if you want, they are really the elements of ferment of social cohesiveness. Okay, so let's watch the scene. This is such a powerful scene and yeah. we'll have some questions for you after it. Here we go. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Mm 
Well, there's so much to say about that scene. I mean, the first thing I think that will jump out at Western audiences is that it's not subtitled. I mean, everything in the film is subtitled. The Bomber is subtitled. Yeah. And Sisiko chooses not to subtitle that. Yeah, neither does Sam Ben in Day. You have this right. gut-wrenching films because both Sam Ben and Sisiko believe that music right is a universal language you don't understand you don't need to know the word to know that he's lamenting something that is lost and actually so interesting in that court everybody speaking in french he's the only one who manages to mesmerize the people by his songs that is sung of course in the in the in the bambara language so his voice is a way in my view to give voice to the voiceless in their own in their own languages. It is really the breaking of silence. It is the only meaningful words that are spoken and sung into all this mock trial. So basically, I think Samben just wanted to give voice to the griot to be the expression of the plight of the people. And so, and we know what he's saying even though we don't know what he's saying. I mean, exactly, exactly. I, you might know something of what he's saying. Maybe you want to share it with us or maybe you don't. Maybe that's privileged for, you know, those of those of you who know, Bom, you know, Bambara and maybe the rest of us um, need to just feel it. Yeah, I mean, no, it's my, my it's very interesting. I, I was able, of course, to translate the, the, the praise song uh, in Sam Ben's film, because I did ask a lot of questions and it was a tribute to women and so on and so forth. This one, I don't know all the details, but also it is a tribute to the Bambara people. It is a, a denounce, denouncing of their plight, of their miseries and an accusation of those who are in front of him, who have been trying to deny him a voice because he does not speak a European language. From a man who um, was already an old man at the time of independence, Yes. from a man who may have grown up in a village that was relatively untouched by colonization, yes. from a man who has in his body a strong memory of 
what it was like to live in a healthy, strong village to see that, you know, I'm, I'm projecting and I'm guessing, no, but, this, right. but, but, you know, the griot tradition is more of a rural tradition than, a, than an urban tradition. So a man who presumably could see the before and after. Yeah, I think he was called actually when he was entering the court for the first time, you know, the guard who was at the door asking him, are you a witness? Said yes. So he was brought in there as a witness, someone to testify to the situation of the people. But as I said earlier, first he was humiliated. An elderly, you don't take away their, uh, their, their heart. The graying hair of an old man should not, is sacred. The first thing he was told, you have to take off your heart. The same way that I remember my grandfather, Semben father, who had to take off our heart when we met a white person in the, in, the, in, the, in the street. It was a way of humiliating yourself, of debasing yourself. And the second, he's told, oh, you can only speak once you have been given permission to speak. And yet, according to social hierarchy, he should be the first one to speak. He's entitled to be the first to talk because he is a voice of wisdom. Right. So we see silencing all African narratives, all African stories, all African wisdoms have been completely erased and replaced with the TV in the middle of the house mm -hmm. with cowboy or lawyers who speak in a language that needs to be translated for the people to, to understand. Mm. It's, yeah. a, it's such a powerful, it's an incredibly powerful um, metaphor. You know, this courtroom, this, this courtyard, courtroom, it's a court, it's a car, courtyard, it's a residential courtyard. I mean, it's not, yeah. there's yeah. no, there's no adornment whatsoever. And, um, and yet, um, you know, the storytelling is so, you know, fundamental. It's well, so it's important true. to everyone and, and everyone's tuning in, everyone's listening through these rudimentary speakers that look like they're from the 1930s, yeah. you know, it's really quite phenomenal that way. And there's no official, you know, this is a trial, but there's no one is going to be um, punished. No, actually, they said in the film, of course, the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund are not going to be indicted. Right. Now, that's very, very interesting. The film was made in, um, in 2006, maybe 10, 10 years later. Now, if you have the International Penal Court, a lot of African leaders, maybe some of them is justified, are being, uh, are being judged at the Hague. Just as the former president of Cote d'Ivoire, uh, Laurent Gbagbo, just got freed after nine years of being jailed for crime against humanity. Well, there is no worse cr crime than the ones that are being committed by the world. By the way, one of the organizing themes of the film is the African debt. 60%. For a Bambara, oh, yes. oh, okay, I thought it was for a Bambara in the Bambara culture. A debt is translated with the word juru. Juru means a noose. Meaning, once you contract a debt, you have given up all your dignity and your self worth. So for the Bambara, a debt is not just a financial transaction. It is what determines the self pride of a Bambara. Actually, if we met in a Bambara, I say, Jason, you want to say, what is it? You say, how much do I owe you? Because owing, you should, a human being with dignity should not owe. And even if I owe you between Bambara, is always transacted in a mediated in a very discreet way. Nowadays, when the World Bank or the International Monetary Fund gives a loan to an African country, it was always in front of international cameras, meaning the worst humiliation is to contract a debt. Amazing. So I think it would be, no, it would be great for us to, to open this up and have some conversation amongst us. I, I think since there's a lot of us, um, I would say, if you have a question, uh, we can turn on our cameras and um, 
raise your hand, stay muted. And, and then when you ask your question, let's be real brief because I think there's gonna be several questions. And so just ask, you know, if, if you don't mind asking your question um, as a question <laughs> and, uh, and um, or, you know, or comment, a, a brief comment, um, but we're gonna try to get around the room. So just be conscious of, of our time constraints here. Dr. Gajigo has been wonderfully generous with his time and it's getting late his time for, um, for a man of um, <laughs> old <laughs> man said it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> he said it. He said it. I didn't say it. So yeah. you, if you, please feel free to turn on your cameras and um, and yeah. join us and wave at us if you would like to um, ask a question. I know Karen had a question about the um, the uh, the final testimony, um, which was epic. It's a really long speech, which you know. And, and powerful. You want to talk about maybe just how you felt when you first saw that speech and, and a little insights into it, the, the, the final testimony. Oh, I, and Karen, are you, are you referring to the, the, um, the French man? Who, yes. Okay. Yes. That's what I thought. So it's not you quite the final either. testimony. I think it's the second, it's, it's the, it's the second to last before the kind of defense. So, yeah. The longest one, the most impassioned one. Where Incredible. The, where the audience is, is applauding in the middle. <laughs> yeah, I think that is, well, I mean, you have two lawyers. You have the lawyer, Mr. Rappaport, who, who, who defends the international institution and the other one who is in defense of the, of the people. I think the final speech just kind of touch the very heart of the issues that people could not refrain themselves from from uploading. And of course, the judge has to tell them you could not upload in a courtroom, which is again silencing an African way of life. People upload. I mean, it would be so interesting to experience a film in an African movie theater, how the public react to what is happening on screen. The same way people react to what is happening on the on the ground. But here again, they are told to remain silent. We haven't had another hand raised yet, so I'm going to ask you that. Oh, Vicky has a question, um, but let me just ask you really quickly. You've seen yeah. African films um, in Dakar. You've seen African films in Ouagadougou. You've seen African films in New York and and San Francisco. How is the audience reaction different? Oh, completely different. Mostly, if it is a film in which the language is the language they understand. I mean, I I, I go to Fespaco, which is a Pan African Film Festival which happens every other year in Ouagadougou, in Burkina Faso, since 1969. I mean, I, I go with colleagues, of course, Americans uh, in the movie theaters. The film is in Bambara, or, yes, it's mostly in Bambara. In Wu, Wu. I mean, people will be singing along with the, with the music of the film. People will be speaking to the people on, 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 on screen. They will be singing, they will be clapping. Of course, I have my American friends who go, Psst. Be quiet. I said, no, that cannot be quiet because it is part of the storytelling. There is, of course, there is a griot, but the story being a communal story, which is known by everybody, there is this kind of, it, 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 there is no copyright for the story. Everybody is entitled to it. Of course, the griot is the one who does the mise-en-scene and the, I think Samben has explained this. He's his own script writer. He's his own actor. He's, so the, the griot is in total communion with the, with the public. The same way people in a movie theater, they relate directly to whatever is happening because they see it as being a public forum in the, in the, in the, in the village. Of course, here, our experience of film working is, is a private experience. That's why Semben, for a long time, he resisted having his films made into DVDs because it defeats the purpose of having people in the same room, having this collective experience of, of watching. So there are two fundamentally different experiences to watch a film in New York where you cannot even breathe <laughs> except to chew your popcorn and of course in an African setting, which is completely different. Beautiful. Okay, Vicky, quick question from Vicky. We're gonna take a three or four fast questions. There are also some and, former- and Vicky, Yeah, and Vicky, you need to unmute first, please. There are also some former Peace Corps volunteers from Mali. I would like to hear from them. Okay. 
I'm sorry, I'm not a Peace Corps volunteer. It's um, okay. uh, um, but uh, for me, the film alluded in a number of ways to the structural adjustments that accompany the World Bank and IMF mm -hmm. uh, loans, which actually do uh, decimate mm -hmm. countries, their education and their social services. Is there anything you would like to say about that? Well, that's where I started. I said I was born in a rural, small rural village. I started going to school in 1960. My parents were, did not have any income. So everything I got in my education was, uh, uh, how do you call it, was um, scholarships from Senegal. Of course, I also got free health care. But starting in the 80s, to kind of privatize all those services in Africa, the International Monetary Fund came up with a program of structural adjustment. What does it mean? The state has to disengage and of course, uh, encourage private entrepreneurship. Uh, so um, yes, and, uh, Right now, for if you go to my village, very few kids can afford to go to the university because I had my free uh, education. So what the what the what the what the IMF did, the International Monetary Fund, was really to to curtail any opportunities of development that were in Africa, and also, of course, by the World Bank by giving these loans with high interest. It is really hijacking the future of all generations, degrading the quality of education. There was, a, I mean, in the 70s, 80s, there, is, there was really a genuine process of democratizing education in many African countries, not anymore, because the poor cannot get scholarship to go to, to go to, to go to school. So the structural adjustment programs, I don't know why they named it that way. It was a progressive way to introduce Africa into the liberal economies of the of the of the, of the West, mm -hmm. basically to tie it, and as a result today, it, not only education is destroyed, healthcare is uh, healthcare is uh, is destroyed, but more and more we consume what we don't produce, and what we produce is sold in the international market. So it is a kind of vicious circle that have people have called the structural adjustment program, and then. And it must be said that that um, Americans are learning to to use some of these tactics on our own youth now. So you know, um, anyway, we're not going to go there tonight. Yeah. <laughs> Edwina, Edwina has a question. Edwina, I had a question, um, sort of related to production. I had first seen this movie about thirteen years ago, and yeah. I was really struck by the textiles. I mean, I you know, I love textiles, and one of I loved watching the production in the courtyard. And the, um, you also see the singer wearing beautiful wax cloth garments. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the, the textile worker in her testimony uh, talks about China and China um, copying their designs and selling them for much less. And you see the, the women spinning in the house. And I'm wondering to what extent um, you know, the, the, the role that China is increasingly playing in, mm -hmm. in Africa is replacing the IMF in any way in the monetary fund? I, I don't know, you know, if, if that's relevant, if, if there's, in, in the years since the, this film has been made, has there been a shift? I just, you know, picked up on that both times. Um, I wondered about that. Well, certainly there is, I think there is, a, there, is, there is a shift. And that shift, if I have to date it, would you go to 1989 when the Berlin War fell? Meaning that, of course, you know, after World War II, the world was polarized between the Soviet Union and then the, the, the United States. And then, of course, when the Soviet Union fell, there was a total vacuum. So it was free reign for Western organi organizations. And one, I just talked about the structural adjustment program. One of the results is that Africa became the dumping ground of the surplus of production in the West. My father was a woodcarver. My mother made incense and uh, jewelry. Well, it would take my, my grandmother, for instance, two nights to make one piece of jewelry. And then the Chinese, the Americans, the French brought trinkets, 
which are three times cheaper. So they progressively killed local craft. You go to Dakar today, people don't have breakfast with millet porridge. It is Nestle coffee, which we don't, which we don't make. And even talking about Nestle, how many thousands or millions of African babies died because of, of that bad milk that was imported from the West. And we are convinced that breastfeeding was not good. And yet for thousands of years, we have been breastfeeding, we have been breastfed. So that structural adjustment program, of course now is complete, still very, very rampant. But then another element came, the vacuum left by the Soviet Union, in my view, again, I'm not a political scientist, but um, has been taken with China, with a new Silk Road. China is now crisscrossing the world. Actually, there is some point where China, China is even doing worse. Because what the Europeans do is that they come and take our products and take them to Europe. Now the Chinese have started coming to Africa to buy land in Africa itself. You can see it in Cameroon for where they bought millions of acres to grow food to export to, to Africa. Look at Addis Abeba in Ethiopia. It has been the center of production of the cheapest, uh, how do you call it, uh, Gardenman economy. So they are stopping our local productions and they are literally pauperizing or proletarizing Africa, Africans basically. So I think China, whether it is China or the Soviet Union or it is Europe, as far as Africa is concerned, I think it is the same, the same logic of exploitation actually. And there is a, I don't want to, make this an academic exercise. But one thing, Walter Rodney, who is from Guyana, British Guyana, wrote this very interesting book in the 80s titled How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. And of course, when we talk about Europe, it's an extensive term to talk about Europeans and, and the Americans. Now you add the, you add the Chinese. Mm. So we have time for one more question. Le that's not, is that Leslie? Who's down there, Leslie? No. Yeah, someone on Leslie's. Here we go. Can you unmute, please? Here we go. Hello. There. My name is actually John House. I'm on my wife's computer. Hi, John. I talk. Okay. Uh, Sorry about that. <laughs> hello, Samba. Hi, uh, how are you doing? Yeah. Um, I'd like you to address one thing that I found fascinating when I was in Mali about the exploitation. Um, and that was how. Uh, the, the World Bank and other lenders uh, basically got, uh, financed uh, the production of things that they wanted uh, mm -hmm. in, in Europe. Yeah. For example, in, in Mali, all of the money came in so that uh, the Malians could grow peanuts and cotton. Yes. And basically all, all they wanted from Mali. So yes. they're willing to finance that, but they didn't put much, any money really into anything else. Well, you know, your remark you are making here is very, very interesting. I think the, excuse my, my French here, the viciousness is not actually in just funding the areas where they want to production. For example, cotton, Senegal is peanuts. Mali, uh, how do you call it? Mali, Burkina Faso, it's cotton. Uh, Cote d'Ivoire is cocoa. What happened is that they destroyed the sustenance agriculture, like the millet and things like the corn, which we, we ate, and they imposed a cash crop, meaning a crop we cultivate for export. But what they also do, there is a term in French called la détérioration des termes de l'échange, meaning the prostitution of the terms of exchange, meaning it is a Europe that fixes the price they want to pay us for our raw materials. And once they transform that raw material, it is they who also decide on the price we are going to buy those, those, finished, those, finished, those finished products. So they, they use funding, of course, to encourage this guy. And again, look, it is a far reaching phenomenon because by imposing the cultivation of only one crop, over time, the land is exhausted. There is no recycling. 
environmental disaster. People have learned they cannot cultivate it. If they cultivate it, it does not produce. Result, our youth are taking to the desert, mostly since the dismantlement of Libya. Now Libya has been the route to the Mediterranean. So since even our land not taken from us, but has been so impoverished, you see that's the result of the imposition of those monocultures and the social and the political results are devastating. Well, I, I want to say, I want to not keep Samba on for long. I really appreciate your beautiful questions and watching this film with us. What I want to say is these aren't the kinds of conversations we often have after American films, are they? I mean, this is, a, you know, the, the, um, this is a real tribute to Sissico mm -hmm. for making a film that would draw so deeply into um, these human concerns yeah. and make us think so much more critically of um, the world we live in. And I just really appreciate um, the work he did, and I really appreciate the opportunity to share it with all of you. Mm -hmm. And I most appreciate hearing Samba being able to talk about it and give us all the insights into it. So, um, kind of a big muted round of applause for everyone who participated. Um, very, really grateful for it all. Samba, do you have any any a, a wrap up thought on on the film or African cinema in general? No, it's, well, I first say that really it's, a, it's always a pleasure for me to be in Santa Fe, whether in person or virtually. I mean, uh, you and I started a companionship for the last 13 or 15 years. So in the United States, maybe I would consider Santa Fe as my second, my second home or my Yeah, and also the kind of work you guys did at the CCA in promoting African, African stories. I think that's a work that is very, very important. Otherwise, the world is going to become a monolith. We have to exchange, we can exchange the raw material, we can exchange everything. But I think the most valuable commodity for exchange is our stories. Uh, we don't want to close ourselves to the under. We have our former president, Senghor, talks about the rendezvous de l'universel, meaning he dreams of a universal banquet where each country contributes a dish. And I think we don't want to come to that banquet empty handed. So our stories are what we want to share with the rest of the world. And uh, Abdurrahman Sissoko is doing a fantastic job in that area. Actually, just last night, he was live on Zoom with the University in, of Washington in Seattle discussing this very, this very film. Our friends. Yes. Our friends. In the, so thank you very uh, much to all for coming. And um, yes, and a special shout out to Denise, our partner in crime who joined us. Thanks for being here, Denise. Thanks, everybody. Um, check out www.ccasantafe.org for upcoming living room shows. Um, watch more African cinema. There's lots available online. And we really appreciate and support your local um, cultural institutions. Uh, if you want to donate to CCA, just visit our website. There's lots of opportunities to do it there. And thank you, Samba. Good night, everybody. Thank you very much, Jason. Thank, thank you, Samba. Thank you, Beverly. Yeah. Thank you, Edwina. <laughs> Merci, Samba. Bonsoir. Allez, Karine, à la prochaine fois, j'espère. À la prochaine. Je t'écris. D'accord, très bien. Et merci. Je vais répondre. Merci beaucoup. Ok, allez, merci, Edwina. Great to see you, Samba.